All right, welcome to Full Momentum and HEC Raz Vodcast. Uh, I am your host, Ben Carey, and here with me as always is Chris Goodell. We have, hey, Ben. Uh, hey, Chris, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. We got a lot of cool stuff today to cover, uh, including reviewing an actual dam breach that occurred in Nebraska last year, uh, some tips for recent uh, college graduates interested in getting into the H&H field. Uh, but first, Chris, we're going to start off a little differently today. I want to know if there's anything uh, over the last eight weeks since this um, pandemic and work from home uh, started, if there's been anything that uh, you have figured out how to cook, uh, learn, <laughs> learn something new to cook, or uh, maybe rediscovered something. Okay, so let me tell you something about myself. And that is, I am not a good cook. <laughs> I never have been. I've never really learned how to do it. Fortunately, I'm married to somebody who's really good. She makes awesome food. So I do get fed well. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you know, my attempts at making meals have always been pretty poor. So I wouldn't say I've, I've really ventured into any uh, new cooking activities while being locked at home. But I'm certainly um much closer and have a lot better access to food than beforehand so that covid uh what is it the quarantine 15 that's uh, <laughs> something i gotta keep an eye on how about you man what are you i know you like to cook right yeah my wife and i do like to cook uh we've been quarantined here with uh, my wife's family so the kitchen's been a little bit crowded uh, in the evenings. so we usually just help out with whatever's uh coming out for dinner, but I have started making uh, quite a bit of, of ramen, real Japanese ramen, which is something that mm. previously I I uh, enjoyed eating ramen quite a bit, but I never made it before. So we've been uh, doing that quite a few times well, a week. Ben, that's ramen. actually one of the few meals I can make because you just buy those little squares, right? And throw it in the pot. Well, this is this is, the... this is more this is a little bit more authentic stuff. This isn't okay, like top, gotcha. top ramen, you know, <laughs> ten cent stuff at the store. This is well, a little bit higher. This staple of my college diet. And top yes, ramen. yeah, it, I, I think it was for most folks. Uh, I think you could get up. about ten of them for a dollar or something back yeah, then. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, this stuff's a little bit nicer, but um, definitely still is a simple dish. But uh, I really like it. And, it reminds me of eating out uh, in the days. It seems like years ago when we could go out to restaurants and have food. So uh, very cool, nice, man. nice little distraction. Yeah, so cool. That That's awesome, Chris. Uh, thanks for sharing about that. Uh, wanted to start today with a special news story. And it's not necessarily a news story that's uh, breaking, but more of a recent study or I guess post study that came out uh, just a few weeks ago on the Spencer Dam break uh, analysis. So the Spence, Spencer Dam breach happened, um, let's pull up the uh, Google Earth image here. The Spencer Dam breach happened in March of 2019 uh, mm -hmm. in, in Nebraska. And this was a, a pretty substantial dam breach. It was kind of associated with a lot of the flooding that was going on in the Midwest uh, in springtime of, of last year. And it's just a really, really interesting uh, case study and something I thought would be worthwhile uh, touching on this on this podcast. So I'm going to give a little bit of background and then we can have a discussion on maybe some relevancy to, to HECRAS. Yeah, so yeah, let's do it. Again, here's, here's Spencer Dam. Uh, this is in Nebraska. And uh, this is the dam itself right here. You have the powerhouse on the northern end and then a short little concrete dam. And then uh, there's a large earthen dike here on the right bank, which extends, oh, I don't know, a few thousand feet. Let's see, uh, looks like extends roughly, yeah, 3,000 3, feet. So uh, almost two thirds of a mile, a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty long uh, earthen embankment there. And so what happened in, in March of 2019 is it was kind of a classic rain on snow event. Um, where you had a lot of snow and ice um, that was on the ground. And this, what they called a bomb cyclone, struck a lot of the Great Plain uh, area here in uh, central United States and caused a, a lot of rain to rain on the, on the snow, uh, a lot of that snow to melt. 
and also a lot of the ice layer on rivers in this area to be broken up. And so you ended up with these large, what they call ice runs, which are more or less big chunks of ice in the river all coming down at once and uh, causing a lot of issues. Um, in anticipation of, of the bomb cyclone, the dam operators opened up all the tanner gates on the dam up to uh, fully open to try to pass as much flow as they, as they could. Um, but there were also a lot of stop log bays here that they were unable to open up because they were frozen solid. So hmm. that was kind of one step in the uh, failure process that occurred here. But if the gates had, if the Tanner gates had stayed open and uh, free flowing, they could have bypassed this. And we'll get to why in a second here. What, what um, river is this again, Ben? Did you say? I Let me open up the analysis here and we can look at the actual report because I do not recall. Um, the Niobrara River. Oh yeah, Niobrara River. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is a, a tributary to the and Missouri. That's a great picture of the dam itself post failure, huh? Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll get to the picture and there's some really good cool Google Earth uh, shots here as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the operators opened up the Tanner Gates. They weren't able to open up some of the sluice bays. Um, but nevertheless, they, they opened that up. And then in uh, the middle of the night on March 14th, um, a large ice run started uh, way upstream of this area um, on the river. And that ice run, which again is, is a, a numerous large chunks of ice coming downstream at the same time. And that along with the flooding that was occurring caused two bridges to actually be knocked out and the debris from those bridges to kind of um, start to move downstream along with this this ice uh, ice run, and the combination of the debris from the bridges and the ice that was building up uh, actually created a debris dam, um, which caused the the river to back up behind that kind of temporary dam. And when the water got high enough, it it breached itself actually, and and so it sent a cascade of of ice and debris downstream, and that ice and debris ended up coming down to Spencer Dam. Uh, blocking all of the Tanner Gate openings so that water wasn't able to, to move through the Tanner Gates. The water backed up behind the dam and eventually overtopped Spencer Dam, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the earthen embankment here on the right, right bank. And when that happened, uh, obviously you have ice and water and debris moving over this, so it was causing some erosion on the downstream uh, end of this, downstream end of this uh, dike here. Uh, caused some head cutting to move up and eventually caused a large breach opening to uh, open up in this in this earthen <laughs> embankment. When that happened, you can see directly downstream of this earthen embankment is a is a little housing area with it looks like a, some uh, RV parking and a couple bathrooms. There was actually somebody who was sleeping in one of these houses, and all of this got knocked out. Mm -hmm. um, what, what it looked like after that happened um, was this. Oh. So again, you can see that breach here on the right embankment caused more or less the channel, the main channel to be diverted through the embankment here, totally washed out that whole uh, park area, took out the roadway downstream of the dam. Uh, and then eventually, you know, this whole thing was, was uh, overflowing. And so the actual concrete structure itself was, was broken up and destroyed as well. So again, mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and forth for those of you guys who missed it, but this was the before, and then this was the after that breach occurred. So it wasn't a, a really high head dam. Uh, we're not talking about a, a massive wave of water that was cascading downstream, but really just a lot of debris and ice and mud and, and, and uh, other things moving downstream just causing a lot of damage specifically locally you know the, the house mm -hmm. the park and the bridge right here so a really really substantial event uh really obviously really sad that somebody lost their life in this um yeah and it's just a, a crazy 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 event and something that i know that i'm not super familiar familiar dealing with ice runs that's not something that's in my vernacular necessarily but um, Chris, I don't know, do you have any experience working with ice runs or rivers that experience ice runs? Not a whole lot. You know, it's uh, it's a tricky thing because of the uncertainty of it. You, you just really don't know how much ice is going to be involved in any given year or any given storm event 
or how much of that will actually impact things. For example, uh, you know, ice being hung up on the tainer gates or plugging up the, uh, the outlet works. You have no idea how that's going to work. Um, and so what do you do? Well, I mean, you can assume that some of these gates are partially blocked and you can do that by maybe closing them a little bit more than they would. Uh, maybe you assume some of them are fully blocked. And uh, this starts to get into the realm of probabilistic modeling, in my opinion, because there's so much uncertainty with how this could happen that if you really want to get a feel, get an understanding of what level of risk you're at with this dam, you, you can't just assume a worst case scenario. You have to look at the, the full suite of possibilities of outcomes um, and scenarios that lead to those outcomes and run them through a probabilistic model. So, you know, as far as ice goes, ice is in, in HECRAS. We talked about that, I think a, a couple um, podcasts ago, maybe the last one, but um, you can do ice modeling on rivers. But in this case, this was set up by an ice jam that failed, right? Yeah. And so to me, that sounds much more like a dam failure even though you know it would be quote unquote an ice dam um you could certainly set that up in ras as a inline structure or an sa 2d area connection if you're doing it in a 2d area and and go ahead and put a breach in there but then again the way that ice dam breaks apart uh, it's got some uncertainty too mm -hmm. um i imagine as opposed to an earthen embankment or an engineered dam that um that ice dam once it goes the whole thing's going to go <laughs> you know you could probably rightly assume there's not going to be a breach opening it's going to be the whole thing washes out then it's just a matter of how quickly it gets to fully blocked to free flowing again um so you got that uncertainty there but then as i mentioned before you got the uncertainty about what all that ice is going to do when it hits the dam and so it's a tricky one um i think what you do is is you know if you can do some probabilistic modeling do a little Monte Carlo. Um, if you just don't have the budget for that or you wanna do something quickly, do the worst case scenario. Assume that that ice dam fails very quickly and then assume that it plugs up all of the outlet works, all the tainer gates, the low level outlets, all of that. And then you'll see, all right, how high does it, uh, um, or how quickly does it overtop the embankment? And then you, uh, then you do a breach from there and you see yeah. what happens. Yeah, I think it's 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 tricky because, you know, obviously in this situation, I don't think anybody, you may have been able to forecast that there would be ice runs and that ice would cause some blockage to the Tanner Gate openings. But I think, you know, I don't know if anybody would necessarily have predicted that an ice and debris dam would form upstream of this dam itself. And then mm. that dam would cause a backup and then a breach. I mean, that's, that's a lot of inference. Um, so I think, yeah. you know, at, at minimum, what you can do is like you touched on, build these assumptions and the uncertainties of ice blockage into your dam breach analysis and your dam safety analysis. I mean, that was one of the takeaways and I forgot to mention it at the onset of this discussion, but this whole report um, and kind of post-op was conducted by ASDSO. Um, so thank you to them for, for conducting that study. Got a lot of really good information out of it. I thought it was really interesting, ASDO, maintains a, a nationwide database of, of dam failures that have occurred mm -hmm. in the United States. And uh, in the last 10 years, there's been 380 dam failures that have been recorded in this database. And there hasn't been a sink. This was, this was the first one that was due to um, ice runs. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's just kind of emphasizes the fact that there's not a lot of information related to how to build these into your dam safety studies, how to build them into your PMFA studies, um, you know, all that, there's just, there's not a lot of, of knowns. And so, you know, one of the, they had a number of takeaways for people to, to take from this study and what happened here and apply it to, to their projects. And one of those was, if you're an engineer working on dams or dam safety in, in cold weather areas, you need to consider, you know, the severity and likelihood of these ice runs and what it could mean for, actual design of the dam and what it can yeah. mean for analyzing uh, potential breach scenarios or blockages right. of your gates. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, 
Well, I think, yeah, and it's, it's, um, it, it is a unique type of failure um, event here for sure, especially in the United States. But uh, I know for sure that other countries in more uh, colder climates, plus Alaska too, they, they, uh, they look at this all the time. They look at ice jams, maybe not specifically for um, effects on dams, but certainly on flooding in general. And it's a, it's a big deal. And they look at that uh, quite a bit. And there's the Cold Regions Research Laboratory in New England that uh, does a lot of work on ice modeling in rivers itself. And so if you ever want to look into that a little bit more, um, go to their website and see what they got going on. They do a lot of really cool research there. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess that's the one positive, and I hate to use that word in this situation um, that might come out of this, is that you know, the fact that somebody lost their life and this was a, a very unique situation, I'm sure there'll be some really, really cool and interesting research that's done by um, university and master's students around the country on on ice runs and their impacts on dam safety, which you know obviously is something that's sorely needed. So let's let's uh, can you go back one to, or to the uh, pre pre failure picture? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about how we would set this up in a RAS model. Sure. Let's do it. Um, so I'm looking at the reservoir here, and maybe normally I might model it as a storage area or, or probably cross sections, but given that it's going to fail and you've got two different outlets now, once it breaches over by Spence, by the uh, uh, in the middle of the um, the long dike there, mm -hmm. that uh, it's probably going to be better to do a 2D area over there, don't you think? Yeah, I agree. And considering too, you have this kind of overflow area, which probably was activated during these floods. So you probably had water coming this direction as well as kind of down the main river stem here. So mm -hmm. it seems like to me a very, very two dimensional situation. Um, yeah. And, you know, the IQ pointed out the fact that you have two locations that are going to be conveying, conveying flow and, and really in different directions. I mean, if we look at, you know, the flow directions, yeah, I guess they're, they're somewhat similar, but um, they're, they're very dynamic. You can actually see that the high flow area is active still in this, in this yeah. room too. So I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking I would do the whole thing 2D until at least you get down beyond where the the um, the new river slams into the wall there. Um, yeah, it looks like yeah, you have some higher ground on either side here. So this would probably be a good transition from your 2D area back to a 1D reach here. Yeah, and then imagine maybe similarly the upstream here. Maybe somewhere like in here would be a reasonable place to put a, a 1D reach and transition it to your 2D yeah. area here. Yeah, go go back down though below the bridge and yeah. you see where the new the new big channel that carved out from that breach. Mm -hmm. And it does an almost 90 degree turn right there when it goes mm -hmm. back to the original river. And yeah. imagine the wave run up on the mm -hmm. um the other bank there. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see like if there's evidence of how high that wave got. But that is something that you need a 2D model to, to, to model. And in fact, in HEC-RAS, you need to do that with the full momentum equation if you want to see uh, that kind of wave run up there. So uh, I, would, I would probably do the reservoir uh, just downstream of the dam and mm -hmm. just downstream of the bridge, all 2D. Yeah, yeah. And, and make, a, make the dam out of an SA 2D area connection and um you know the thing about the bridge there too is is um likely well it certainly was overtopped on the approach the roadway approach mm -hmm. that can be modeled as another sa 2d area connection and you could breach that too what do you uh, think the about the idea given that you had a breach here and then the overtopping of the whole structure caused this to fail as well down here what would you think about splitting this connection up instead of using a single um SA2D connection mm -hmm. split up into two, one representing the dike and one the actual structure itself. That oh, way yeah. Kind Absolutely. of split up, split up the breach parameters and the and the actual breaching of this separately. And that seems like that would be a good approach. What do you think? I agree. I agree because you get one breach per structure. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to breach in two locations here, yeah, you'll have to split it up into two. And, and then it's just a matter of how do you deal with the bridge there? Because in the current version of HECRAS 5.0.7, there's no, um, you can't do overtopping of bridges or pressure flow bridges in 2D areas. You could certainly model it as a um, SA 2D area uh, connection and maybe simulate the openings with 
culverts or gates. Uh, or if you wait just a little bit until 5.1 comes out, they got some really cool um, new bridge routines for 2D areas that will be uh, very nice to have. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I think that would, that's that's a, a valuable discussion there, Chris, and kind of helps us frame this scenario and how we would model it if we were doing a dam safety study on, on Spencer Dam. I, I don't anticipate Spencer Dam is being rebuilt, but uh, if it is, I'm, I, I know that they'll be doing some 2D modeling to analyze some the dam safety components of it. Yeah, and I think um, just back to how we would model this, I, you know, like I said, I think a lot of it's got to be 2D until you get downstream of that bar maybe. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit further, but um, I would probably do, and what I usually like to do is have a separate 2D area upstream of the dam and a different one downstream, as opposed mm -hmm. to having one continuous 2D area. Mm -hmm. And that just allows you to set up your initial conditions a lot better. You can have two different starting water levels. You can have the reservoir level, and then you can either start the downstream 2D area out dry or with a, a small amount of flow in it. Um, and so it, it's a lot easier to get to your starting condition that way. You don't have to deal with long initial conditions time or doing a hot start or anything like that. So, yeah, agreed. Awesome. Cool. I think that was a good conversation, a uh, good yeah. discussion on something that's obviously relevant to, to what we do as h, &H engineers, as well as um, HECRAS modeling specifically. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Ben. That was really cool. Um, yeah. And thank you again to to all the people on ASDSO that were part of that that uh, forensic study on uh, what happened and what we can do better next time. Uh, so before we get into the main topic for today, I just want to uh, give a plug to our sponsor. Um, so our, we're thankful to be sponsored by our firm Kleinschmidt Associates, uh, who is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. And uh, just a reminder, not only has Kleinschmidt been very supportive of uh, this podcast that Chris and I have taken on, but uh, we're really excited to be teaching the first Kleinschmidt HECRAS 1D, 2D class online um, next week, May 20th. Is that right, Chris? That is correct. So everybody sign up. Um, if you need some training on 1D, 2D, this will be a great opportunity to do it from your home office you don't even have to travel yeah absolutely i know that we're both excited about that um i think we already have over 20 people that have signed up for that class and hopefully we'll get be getting more over the next week um, if you guys have any questions about the class or just want to learn more leave some comments in this video and we can uh we can address those or reach out to you individually if you uh if you need some some help answering what that training is going to be all about so uh make sure make sure to sign up so today's uh, the main topic for today is we really wanted to, in the spirit of the fact that you know it's it's early May here, there's a lot of uh, uh, seniors that are graduating from college, a lot of hopefully a lot of H and H engineers that are coming out ready to start looking for work and um, you know, using their degree for for some really really cool applications. And just in the spirit of that, and the fact that a lot of these folks are going to be coming out into kind of a difficult maybe a difficult job environment, or at least um, a, a, maybe a delayed job environment here as everybody's working from home. We just wanted to give some some tips for people that were looking at kind of breaking into the H&H &H industry. Uh, so we're just going to go through a couple topics today. Chris and I are just going to have some conversations, and then we'd love to hear questions or comments that you guys have, any recent graduates or people that are still in school looking for internships. You know, Feel free to, to leave some comments in the videos. We'd love to to see what you guys are thinking and saying, uh, and maybe answer some questions on the next next podcast. So uh, the first first topic yeah. today is just you know about the seniors. Um, a lot of you guys are coming out. It might be difficult in the next few weeks or months to find a job, just given the fact that there might be some hiring delays based on uh, the current COVID pandemic. Uh, but with that, there also might be some. Uh, pretty cool opportunities from a training or learning standpoint. And so we wanted just to highlight uh, what those could potentially be specifically re related to HECRAS. So Chris, why don't you talk a little bit about if somebody's just graduating now, they maybe know a little bit about HECRAS, but they want to learn more. They want to come into their first job, kind of hit the ground running. Um, what are some cool things they can they can look at, look at uh, training? 
Yeah, and it's a really good question. And I've actually had some people reach out to me uh, recently asking, hey, what can I do? What's a good way to get in front and, and, and boost my resume and basically make myself more competitive in looking for a job? Because once things start to open up, you know it's going to be competitive, right? People are going to be trying to get all these H&H uh, &H jobs that, that start opening up again. That being said, don't, uh, uh, don't be too discouraged right away. There are some firms hiring right now um there especially some of the bigger ones um they have not slowed down one bit so don't assume that there are no jobs out there just uh start looking around get on the linkedin and, and that kind of stuff now specific since this is the heck raz podcast i uh i highly encourage graduating seniors or graduate students who are finishing up if you don't have heck raz on your resume you don't have experience in it and you want to go into a water resources related field you need to get it okay some schools um strangely enough <laughs> who teach uh hydraulic engineering or water resources science or something like that they don't do heck raz instruction um i'm still kind of shocked at that that that's not happening um, because if you look around every single firm that hires a water resources related position has HECRAS listed on mm -hmm. the desired skills, <laughs> what mm -hmm. they want you to have uh, before they'll hire you. And so it's incumbent upon yourself to get that training if you don't already have it. The good news is there's lots of ways to do that where you can get yourself trained up, you can get that experiment, experience, and you can feel confident putting that on your resume. And so let me show you a little bit about how you go uh, to do that. First of all, um ben i want to give you and and your alma mater um gonzaga some kudos because gonzaga is definitely one of those schools that does teach heck raz and i know that for a fact because i know you and sebastian and aaron lee all got training in heck raz so yeah shouts to uh shouts to dr suny's go to there gonzaga teaching yeah. alex and uh, pumping out some yes. good HECRAS modelers for that's sure. Right, that's right. So um, <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to share my screen here because I'm going to show you some things that you guys can work on if you want to self-teach. All right. So first thing we have is everyone knows this, this is the HECRAS window. If you don't know it, uh, go figure it out <laughs> quickly because <laughs> that's what this class, that's what this broadcast is all about. Okay, this is HECRAS. All right, so there's stuff right here in the software that you can use for self-training. And notice this little help menu item. Click on that and you can see you've got all the manuals right here you can have quick access to. Um, you've got release notes. This tells you specific to individual versions, what's new, what bugs have been fixed, things like that. You can go right directly to the HEC RAS webpage. I'll do that in a second. There's a lot of great references there. But one thing besides the importance of reading the manuals, user's manual, the supplement, if you, you want to do 2D man, uh, modeling, the 2D modeling manual, the hydraulic reference manual, that gives you more of the theory and the, uh, the guts of the program, right? But here's the important one, this applications guide. Not too many people know about it or use it. But if you want to teach yourself how to use HECRAS, especially starting from scratch, the basics, go through this applications guide. I've got it open right here. Okay. If you install the software and you allow it to install the documentation with it, you'll find that. Let me show you where it gets put. If you go to your root drive, program files, x86, HEC, HEC RAS 507 or whatever version you're working on, um, but you should be working in 507. And then there's a documents folder. And in there, you see all the documents I just mentioned, including this applications guide. So you open that up and you'll see this, um, the cover page here with this very old picture. I think this is the very first applications guide had the same picture of this computer from like 1990 or something. You can even, if you look close, you can see there's even a, a little space for a floppy drive. Uh, ben, do you know what a floppy drive is? I do. No, I'm not that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's the thing we used to use. Um, 
And um, anyway, so this is the applications guide. And what you'll see when you go through here is you've got 24 different chapters. Each chapter is a different type of HECRAS model. And so if you're interested in a specific feature in HECRAS, let's say bridges. Well, if you go down to chapter two here, you've got a single bridge, a very simple bridge, but you can see how it's put together. And what the applications guide does, it's so awesome, is it steps you through the process of how that model was built and why it was built the way it was built. And so in a bridge model, for example, chapter two here that you're looking at, you can um, find out, okay, why were there ineffective flows put around that bridge opening and how were they placed? And what were some of the bridge modeling approaches used? Mm -hmm. How is the bridge actually input? In? And it discusses all of that stuff. And you can go through step by step and learn how to do HECRAS modeling. Now, the one disadvantage of the applications guide is it hasn't been updated yet to include 2D modeling. So if you do want to get into 2D modeling, you'll have to uh, search elsewhere. And there are places to find that out as well. But this is great for. Um, for basic 1D modeling, 1D unsteady and steady flow modeling. It's a perfect yeah. way to get, get yourself trained up in that. Now, Chris, so mm -hmm. the if people are able to download the HECRAS software, and again, in order to download it, you can just go to HEC's website, is that right? Yeah, and let's do that right now. Um, I'm gonna take you right to the HEC's website. If you uh, don't have the link on hand or you can't remember, just remember, just type in HECRAS. HECRAS, H-E-C-R-A-S. That'll take you, uh, one of the first things, if not the first thing that pops up will be the um, Hydrologic Engineering Center, H-E-C. And then in there, you can navigate down to HECRAS. And here I'm on the HECRAS page of H-E-C's website. And um, sorry, that's not the HECRAS page. This is the HECRAS page right here. And you know it because it's got some HECRAS looking windows in there. And you can see on the left-hand side, we've got features, what's new, downloads. This is where you get the software if you haven't figured that out yet. Documentation, this is a very important one here because in addition to all of the manuals that come with the software, there's some other things too. You've got release notes, you've got what's new. You've got these research documents here too, okay? Um, here's specifically how you do bridge backwater analysis. ATC RAS for dam break studies. This is one of my favorite documents of all time right here, TD39. I reference this thing all the time when I'm doing a dam breach model. It's very comprehensive. It's got a lot of good information and it talks specifically about how you do dam breach modeling in HECRAS. Okay, so there's like a lot of great information there. Um, but beyond that, if you go over to publications up on the top, there's all sorts of other stuff in here too. You've got uh, old computer program documents in here. Uh, if you're ever interested in some of the old legacy software or some of the other software that's still out there that's that's being used a lot, but but is not HECRAS, uh, look in there. Um, scroll down a little bit. Um, you've got, let's see, prog project reports. So this is specific, specific projects being done in the Corps of Engineers that HEC has had some involvement of, I presume. Um, then you've got your research document, your RD documents. Okay, so there's some really good information in here. Just search around. There's a lot of old stuff too. So uh, you may find some really old manuals in here. Um, but here's where I really wanted to get down to the technical papers, the TP documents, and the TD documents, technical documents. This has got a lot of really good stuff. And here you can see TD39, my favorite one. Uh, but look through here, you've got stochastic analysis of drop, drought phenomenon. I mean, just some pretty random things in here. Uh, I was flipping through this a little bit earlier and um, I saw this, or was it? Um, I wondered, oh, what is this? This heck, heck rat river analysis system, old TP document. I opened it up and this is the very first user's manual. Look at this, it's only 16 pages. <laughs> so uh, this is way back in 1994. Um, and this is when it first got started. And if you look through here, you'll notice the names are the same, same people are there. Gary Bruner, <laughs> Mark Jensen, Steve Piper. Those are the guys who kind of started the whole thing. And you can see a really old version of the geometry window right here. Um, 
yeah but they were even doing bridges uh at the very first version so uh, very that's cool. pretty cool yeah so there's that uh definitely get on there um there's also the ras solution too uh highly encourage you to get into the ras solution and um that's the website the blog that i run and we post stuff up there all the time there's links to videos there's a forum too where you can ask questions and then of course the youtube video if you haven't figured this out yet i mean this this um podcast you're listening to right now is posted right up here um just check out the playlist check out full momentum podcast and then we also have in here lots of other videos including Cray Price's really fun and entertaining and very educational HECRAS videos that I highly encourage you to take a look at. Yeah. So what do you think, Ben? Yeah, that's great. So Chris, let's talk about now, uh, you know, you have somebody who's just graduated from school. They're excited about getting into the H&H &H industry. Maybe they've done some of the training uh, that we recommended as far as getting up to speed on HECRAS. And now they're choosing an H&H &H firm and they want to figure out you know, which firm's right for me. Hopefully they're choosing between multiple offers. Mm -hmm. So I have just a couple tips here that I was going to recommend and we can just briefly, briefly discuss. Um, yeah. One thing that I, I would definitely recommend to folks is don't assume you know what you want to do, especially if you're an undergraduate just coming out. You're going to learn so much in your first couple of years. Um, you're going to find out that there's stuff you thought you were really going to enjoy that you think's boring. There's stuff that you're going to think you would never want to do and you end up really, really liking it. So just be open to, to different opportunities. Um, pick a place where you can really add to your toolbox as an engineer. There's so many different software programs and technical skills and um, soft skills, whether it be presenting or teaching. Um, pick, so pick somewhere you're going to be able to add to your toolbox because, you know, what you're able to to do and what you're able what you know is the, your value to not only a company you're going to be working with, but potentially a new company in the future. So pick somewhere uh, that you can add to your toolbox. Um, and then lastly is, is just really try to um, have a lot of communication with the people at the firm that you're choosing between whether you meet them in person, do some research online uh, about projects that they've done or, or people that they've worked with just kind of figure out, get a feel for um, different people's opinions uh, of the company that you're, you're choosing. You have any, anything else with that? I think those are all, all really good points, Ben. I mean, there's the obvious stuff like uh, salary and benefits and things like that, that uh, are obviously important. Uh, so you want to weigh that. Um, get into the culture of the company. I think you were getting on, getting to this, Ben, but you know, by, by talking to folks who work there, uh, there are places online now you can look at, um, what is it, Glassdoor or something like that. There's a web page where um, you can actually see um, people's who work at these companies, their own takes on their their company and, and what it's like there. And look for one with a good culture, with good people, um, mm -hmm. top to bottom. That's, that's what you got to look for because that's going to be very enjoyable and that's worth Honestly, to me, that's worth some uh, salary. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you have to, if you have to take, you know, a little bit less, but you're getting into a firm that, hey, this is going to be a lot of fun. These people are good people. Um, we're going to have a good time doing this. Then, yeah, it's worth it. So definitely yeah, look at the culture. I know we both feel that way about Kleinschmidt, and it's both. It's a, it's a reason why we're both so happy here. Um, another thing I just wanted to touch on was. You know, once you do get hired at a firm, you know, now you've chosen your firm, you're moving on to the next step where you're trying to kind of make a name for yourself at your company and in the industry as a whole is, you know, find something maybe that your company doesn't do super well or maybe doesn't have a lot of experience in. Um, and if you have those skills, make sure that those skills are known to people uh, at the company. Make sure you're trying to find project way, uh, ways that you can implement those skills into different projects. We're talking about things like, for instance, if you're an H and H engineer, maybe you have some coding experience, or maybe you're really comfortable and really good at public speaking or presenting, uh, teaching. Maybe you're interested in getting a new certification that opens up a new business area within your company, uh, or a new skill, a new software that you want to learn. Or maybe you're somebody who's really willing and excited to do field work, um, and that might be something that's that's really valuable to your company. So. Mm -hmm. Find something yeah. there that maybe is outside of the normal job description that you you know find when you're applying for a job and make it your own. I know each of us, along with a number of other people at Kleinschmidt, 
have have done this and it's worked out really well for them because not only are you able to uh, kind of make a name for yourself and build out a niche within your company, but you're also uh, doing something that hopefully that you're interested in and you're really good at. Yeah, definitely find that niche. Be a niche person in your company because that that is how you get recognized and that's how you increase your value to the firm. And when people around the firm know you for that, they know you're the person to go to, you're the go-to person, um, then that just makes you that much more valuable. And and especially like you say, if it's if it's what you like to do, that's that's even better. But I would say right now, being able to code is huge. I mean, in the H and H world, that's going to become more and more needed. Uh, if you are just starting out and um, you're wanting to get in the world of H and H, being able to code, whether it's Python or uh, using Visual Studio and doing some um, object-oriented programming, uh, Java, R, for example, is another good one. Um, I see a lot of people coming out of school with MATLAB experience, not really used all that much in private industry, but uh, it definitely gives you a good start on some of these other languages. So definitely get into that. Yeah, for sure. What was your niche, Ben? Or what is your niche, you think? Uh, I think, well, yeah. obviously at Kleinschmidt, um, I recently became the first certified floodplain manager at the company. So working a lot with FEMA related work uh, has opened up a number of, of new project opportunities. So that's kind of a niche. And then I think the other thing that has helped me is just, um, I guess, my comfort level with speaking and teaching. Um, and so people kind of know me as somebody who they can plug and play in a scenario where I have to talk to clients or um, other teaming members about technical topics. And, you know, just having that comfort level is, is really valuable as an engineer um, and, and even more so in the H&H &H world because of how multidisciplinary a lot of projects are so yeah um, that's been something that's that's served me really well so and and like you said chris if you if you can learn coding or if you have some coding experience or if you're really comfortable with speaking or presenting make sure you emphasize that in your interviews too that you don't just talk about the stuff that the firm would naturally talk about whether it be heck you know heck -raz modeling or design experience or whatnot emphasize some of those other skills that are outside the job description and it'll 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 pay dividends for you later on yeah, definitely. Uh, really good points. Yeah. And the last last topic I wanted to touch on before uh, this podcast wrap, wrap, uh, wraps up today is the best way to engage a company. This is something I think especially engineers struggle with sometimes is they know maybe there's a few firms they're really interested in working for. But in your experience, especially have, being somebody that I'm sure many, many people have approached about working with uh, you, what are some of the best and maybe not so best ways of approaching somebody at a current company that you're interested in working for? That is a great question. And I've got a lot of experience with this. Uh, I'll start with the bad way. First of all, don't send in a, um, a poor resume. Uh, do, don't, uh, sorry, do research on the company that you're, if you're really interested in working there, um figure out what it's all about at a minimum get on their website ask other people about them that you might know but get into the website go through the about section if there's a mission statement if there's a um you know a, a philosophy that they post up on the website know what that is and then work that into your interview and how you would fit into that philosophy or the, that culture or how you would contribute to the mission of their mission mm -hmm. statement. So do some research ahead of time. I've gotten some resumes where it was obvious the person had no idea what kind of firm I was. They were just throwing stuff out. And uh, one person, I worked for a, a company that was did exclusively water resources engineering. That's it, nothing else. And I got a resume from a mechanical engineer. And in his cover letter, he told me, how he would be such a perfect fit for the company. <laughs> so we obviously did no research to find out we didn't have mechanical engineers. So, um, or maybe he was trying to open up a new business sector, Chris, and he was going to he was going to bring a niche, a niche yeah, skill. I don't business. think that was it, but here's some great ways. Um, reach out. So I've had a number of people who will email or call me and say, Hey, I, I'm just, want to learn a little bit more about the industry and, and 
and can I meet you uh, over coffee or something and let's talk about it. Um, okay, truth be known, I know the angle there. I know what they're getting at. They want a job, but hey, I appreciate that they're they're coming at it from a point of, I want to learn how to get into this industry mm -hmm. and uh, I want to hear what you have to say about that. And so it becomes a an informal interview. This person has just got themselves an interview. And if they come across, wow, this person is fantastic, or they would fit in great here. And at the same time, we have an opening at Kleinschmidt, and I'm, you know, it's the same everywhere else, other firms too, that that might lead very well lead to a job. If nothing else, you've talked to somebody in the industry, in the local area, and you've got a new contact. And you can mm -hmm. say, hey, I talked to so-and-so, and they said, I should talk to you. And now you're building your network already before you have a job. So yeah. really important to do that. I think that's the biggest mistake that people make. And I think part of it is just, you know, the age that we live in, which is, you know, everything is on computers, everything's online. It's so tempting just to send emails, send resumes, reach out on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of um, passive ways of, of getting in contact with people, but there's so much value in, like you said, being proactive before there's even a job posted. Maybe their company specifically says they're not hiring for your position. They might not be hiring, but the people that are working there, a lot of people will still be willing to meet with you, talk with you about what they do, the company. Um, you might learn that, actually, I don't want to work for this company anymore. I'm not going to bother spending time on a resume but maybe you get a recommendation for a firm that you're more interested in because everybody in the H and H world is very connected. Um, you know, approaching people at a, at a conference booth is another really good way because again, anytime you can get face to face um, conversation going, you can have some recognition there. What happens is, is what Chris said is oftentimes either they'll say, Hey, I really like this person. Any chance we need to hire somebody in this area or at the very least when there is a position that opens up and then your resume comes through, that person will remember you and you'll already have such a leg up on the competition. So um, yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, Chris, you can attest to this. Obviously resume is important. It's, it's something mm -hmm. that can, can eliminate you from a position, but having even a, just a very short superficial relationship where you've just met with somebody, you're just briefly talking about it. Um, the relationship side of things is so, so important when you're trying to find a job. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, it's um, especially if it's an entry level position, you know, they may have 10 different things they're expecting you to know, including heck rats. But really, they don't expect you to know any of this stuff. I mean, you're coming right out of college. They expect you to have a college degree. What people are looking for is a good personality. They're looking for somebody that fits into their culture well. And what people want is they want people that they like working around them. So if you're a likable person, if you come across likable, uh, interesting, engaging, that's going to give you such an advantage. And it's really hard for us engineers to do that because we're not built that way, right? We're built to kind of hunker down in our cubicles in the corner. And, and uh, uh, we were the original social distancers, right? I mean, <laughs> the engineers, maybe not you, Ben. Ben's a pretty, for yourself. Uh, Ben's a pretty <laughs> social guy, but you know, there's a lot, there's a reason that a lot of us are engineers, right? It's, it's a comfortable um, place to be and you got to break out of that. Okay. Now that's not to say you're not going to get hired if you uh, aren't an outgoing person and by, by no means do you have to be somebody you're not, but try to be personable, try to show um uh, uh you know a good side of yourself something that people will say hey that that's somebody that i would like to work here and that goes so far especially for these entry-level positions yep yep absolutely enthusiasm willing to learn all those things are going to mean a lot more than your gpa that you got during your undergrad so that's the other thing too is enthusiasm and passion mm -hmm. if you can demonstrate that that hey i'm passionate about this I cannot wait to get started. I don't even care if you give me any time off. <laughs> Not really. I mean, but but you know what I mean? It's like you got to come across that way. Like you're you just can't wait to get started. You're passionate about it. And, uh, yeah. you know, the last thing you want to do, and I've had this happen in a few interviews, uh, they'll come in and, and, you know, you start talking about stuff and then it, it quickly becomes evident that the, their number one concern is how much time off am I going to get? Am I going to have time to 
you know, every evening go uh, hiking and, and uh, um, go out to the movies or, or whatever. I mean, those are very important things and work-life balance is very important, but you don't want to come across as, hey, that's my focus. You want to show passion for the industry, for the job that you're mm-hmm. trying to get. And if you, if you get into a good company, um, that work-life balance will be there and you'll, yeah, you'll enjoy care. it. Yeah, 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 but absolutely. don't don't come into the interview just you know focusing on all all the time off that that you're going to get or not. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So just to recap that you know conversation, I think there's a lot of really good points in there. Again, we wanted to have this conversation just with the sensitivity. We know there's a lot of seniors that missed out on their last semester of college, um, which can be disappointing. But we wanted to hopefully give some people a jump start on breaking into the H and H world. So if you have some time, some spare time, either because you're having a hard time finding a job or there's just some delays because of COVID, do some training. There's a lot of online resources that are free, uh, easily available, and you can you can do some self-teaching there that'll really help your resume. Uh, make sure you figure out what the best firm is for you. There's going to be some research on your end that's involved with that. Um, choose somewhere that you can build your toolbox and, and add to your skills and abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get hired, find somewhere, find something that um, you really enjoy and that you're really good at, and that maybe is a niche that you can grow your name within your company around. Um, and when you're reaching out to a company for the first time, don't, if you can, don't do it uh, online. Try to do it in person if you can, whether it's at a conference, just getting coffee with somebody who works there, um, just be engaged, show that enthusiasm. It'll really, really help you out um, as you move towards your career, which is an exciting time. I know Chris and I have both uh, loved our time as H&H engineers. It's a great field. Um, There's a lot of great people that are involved with it. Um, So we wish all the 2020 graduates great luck in finding jobs, hopefully soon. And um, speaking of, if any of you are listening to this, are interested in working for Kleinschmidt, uh, we're always hiring different positions, uh, including H&H engineers. So keep an eye on our website for openings. We'd love, we're always looking to add young, enthusiastic talent um, that are interested in, in doing some really cool h and modeling and hydraulic engineering. So, Yeah, definitely. Uh, reach out too. If you're in the uh, Portland area or you want to be in the Portland yeah. area, uh, just let us know. Yeah. So. Or you can also sign up and take our 1D2 RAS class and then we'll definitely know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Awesome. Anything Very else, cool. Chris, today before we wrap up? That's it, man. This was a really good podcast. Um, I uh, really like this topic because, hey, we were all there, right? We all know what it's yeah. like. It's a struggle. I have my own struggles to uh, to get into the industry and just uh, work on that niche. Get that yeah. thing that sets you apart and then just go get it. Be aggressive, be outgoing, be engaging and show that passion. And more than anything, Learn heck raz if you don't already. And if you already do, learn some more. Yeah, Become get an better. expert, right? Because that's exactly. going to really be a huge boost to your resume. So uh, with that, um, yeah, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Absolutely. Um, thanks again for everybody uh, tuning in. Hopefully you got something in, out, of this, out of this podcast. We'll be publishing another one in the next week or two. Uh, but until then, this has been Full Momentum and HEC Raz Podcast.